Grand Theft Auto 4 was a massive success. I think we all already know that, but it was also a template for the kind of game Rockstar would go on to try making with GTA 5. Even in 4's base game, there were seeds planted for two separate stories taking place simultaneously alongside Nico's. That of the lost MC biker, Johnny Klebitz, in the game's first DLC, The Lost and Damned, and the story of the bodyguard and pseudo-son of the titular character in the second DLC, The Ballad of Gay Tony. Now, I myself didn't play The Lost and Damned when it first came out. I can't remember if I had a specific reason to avoid it, but I think it was just because back then I still relied on my parents to buy games and whatnot for me. And when the first one came out, I just couldn't get it. By the time Ballad dropped, though, I managed to convince my folks to get it for me, and I ended up having some of the most fun I ever did with GTA 4's world and characters, especially in the DLC's updated online version of Liberty City at the time. But this was 14 years ago. Oh god, I'm old. Oh, I'm like the Crypt Keeper! And after playing through GTA 4 again recently, and coming to the conclusions I did in that massive video, which nobody watched, go watch it, I planned to eventually make my way through the game's two DLCs as well to see how well they held up in comparison to the base game and to GTA 5 for that matter. And well, it's Pride Month, so while GTA isn't exactly the most progressive of franchises, often quite the opposite in fact, even it couldn't avoid the fact that by 2010 the culture had shifted. Shifted enough to probably convince Rockstar to at least try and be a little bit more inclusive in their representation, which up to that point had been almost exclusively poor and juvenile, at least when it came to the LGBTQ. So anyway, I thought what better time to look at the only GTA title that literally says it right on the tin with The Ballad of Gay Tony. Join me for a trip down memory lane and be on the lookout. I plan to also do a Criminal History episode on this DLC's titular character, which you'll have to sign up on Patreon or join as a YouTube member to see, so if that interests you, do that. Otherwise, you'll have to wait a while to see it. Anyways, enough with the rambling, let's jump into it. Yeah, like I said, man, everything's a little fussy. Well, if you think of anything else, Mr. Lopez. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll give you a call. Thanks. Yo, what's up, Bobby? Hey, Chris? Hey. I'm at the bank. The place got robbed. Nothing to do with me, I, I swear. Um, some Irish guys. Anyway, um, listen. I'm coming over, okay? So wake up. You hear me? Wake up. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I was working late at the club. Yeah. Mommy, don't be like that, okay? I'll be home soon. Look, I, I gotta go. Okay. So, to start, I absolutely love the theme song for Ballad of Gay Tony and just the atmosphere in general is so much more upbeat and fun. A lot more like GTA 5 than anything in 4 or The Lost and Damned. This is also probably the GTA 4 DLC that I spent the most time in, 
maybe even more than the base game, considering that the online version of this DLC was the best one to play. The true golden days of the original GTA Online before it became the horribly mutated beast that it is today. Maybe it's the music, maybe it's just the nightclubs and the lights and the nighttime atmosphere, but this DLC really gives me Vice City vibes and I love it. Our main character this time around is a man named Luis Fernando Lopez. Luis is a bouncer slash bodyguard slash business partner to the titular Tony Prince and also kind of his pseudo son and best friend. Their dynamic is, most of the time anyways, one of the sweeter ones in the series, though it must be kept in mind that this was 2008 or 2010 technically, but 2008 in game. So while more progressive and accepting in comparison to any other game in the series, featuring a main character who is queer, it's also still, well, it was 2010. That's all I can say. There's still lots of stuff in this DLC that made me literally wince like, ooh, that didn't age well. Anyway, this first actual mission is barely a mission at all. It really just consists of driving first to Tony's club, Hercules, where we meet Troy, and then to his main club, Mason at Nine, where we get to see the club hanging out mechanics, and then meet Luis's friends, Armando and Enrique. The final leg is just driving back to Luis's apartment, and that's about it. A feature that was first introduced in The Ballad of Gay Tony is the mission report at the end of each mission. This tells you how you did and gives you a percentage score, and you can also later replay the missions to try and do even better. This is a feature that would be carried over into GTA 5, and one that I imagine will return in GTA 6, but it is still neat. It's mostly for completionists, and encourages you to do your best if you're that kind of a player, but no matter the context, I simply am not that kind of a player at all. I don't really care about speedrunning or playing as efficiently as possible, so I'll mostly be ignoring this feature. I like that you actually start this game with a number of outfits to choose from, unlike GTA 4, which gives you one outfit and really poor choices in terms of your clothing, and just in general in terms of your customization. I don't remember yet though if there are actually any better choices at the clothes stores or if you can even buy new clothes at all, but, well, let's go find out. Uh, nope, doesn't look like you can actually buy new clothes anymore, which is fine, honestly. It would be nice, though, if you could buy new outfits entirely or unlock them, like in Vice City Stories, which might still be possible. We'll see. I don't think so, though. It's nice that you start the game with the upgraded arsenal from the base game, instead of having to start with the crappy lower tier guns and earn the better ones as you go though, because Luis's first gun is the Desert Eagle. There will also be a number of new guns added to the game by the DLC, which fully fleshes out the four era weapons, but sadly, none of the guns added in The Lost and Damned appear to have made it into this DLC. I'm not actually sure, but it kind of seems like with Ballad of Gay Tony, they introduced a lot of new color schemes for cars, like this very bright red shafter. I'm going to try and hold on to this car for as long as I can. We'll see how that goes, though. And then I lost the door about two minutes later, because parking on the streets of LC is impossible. This isn't unique to Ballad, or even GTA 4, but 4 is definitely the worst for it. RIP. So, for the first mission after the initial training one, I went to Louise's mom's house for the mission Mama's Boy. Here, we are introduced to arguably our first secondary antagonist in Mr. Santos. However, I can't actually remember if we get to do the classic GTA thing of eventually killing him. I guess we'll see. This mission will introduce us to a new mechanic in cage fighting, though. It also offers us our first choice, a lot sooner than the base game's first one, too. Here, Mr. Santo asks Luis to win two fights and then lose intentionally on the third so that he can make big money on the bets, 
but you don't actually have to do that. However, considering that Louise's mom is in potential jeopardy here, I think it makes the most sense for Louise to do as he's told, and we can still come back later and fight like normal, so it shouldn't be a problem. It got pretty hairy there, as I almost died in the second fight, so all I had to do on the third one was just immediately take a dive, and then it's a mission complete. During the initial cutscene for that mission, though, Louise's mom literally puts her son's life on the line because... Well, it's never specified why exactly she owes money to Mr. Santo, but she literally puts her own son up and offers very little resistance to his dangerous insistence. Then later, when you take the dive in the fight, she actually has the nerve to chastise Louise for being a loser. So, wow, holy crap. Louise's mom is super toxic and a awful person. Like, wow, this disgusted me. And Louise's friends will later defend this kind of behavior, but my goodness, just awful. This really made me hate her character a lot. I lost a fight for you, mommy. I didn't ask you to lose no fight. I did not ask for losers in my family. You know what? Forget about it, ma. Just don't go borrowing any more money. See you soon. After the fight, I was still very injured, and my goal, like it usually is at the beginning of each playthrough, was to not die at all. Not even once. So, I had to make it to somewhere safe, where I could get food, without getting into an encounter that made me take the tiniest bit of damage. Thank God for American fast food, I guess. Now, I don't think there's a lot of new radio stations or songs. It's mostly just the same ones from the base game and from The Lost and Damned. However, there is one new station which happens to be one of my favorite stations in the whole series. Aside from the announcer, Vice City FM. See, it definitely wasn't just me that got VC vibes from this DLC. So too did the developers, clearly. As it turns out, though, you actually don't unlock all weapons right at the beginning, because you cannot buy an RPG right when you walk in. Which is probably for the best. Everything else, though, appears to be available right from the start, including the M16, though, sadly, it isn't exactly cheap. Now, in the very first mission, we were introduced to the fact that Tony doesn't exactly have a great head when it comes to business decisions. Certainly not these days, when he's rather frequently making those decisions while inebriated or high as hell on a variety of drugs. We learned that he was dumb enough to sell the clubs to two separate people, Mori Kibbutz, a violent loan shark, and the Ancelotti crime family, one of the five mafia families running Liberty City. And the person who does the collecting for the Ancelottis is the guy who GTA 5 players will be familiar with, Rocco Pelosi, along with his uncle Vincenzo, Rocco's a yes man. In this mission, we learn that Rocco is actually really, really young. It's kind of weird because I remember him looking a lot older in GTA V, just five years after the events of this game. He looks like a fully grown man there, but in this game he's berated by Louise and Tony as being very, very young. Maybe this is just a commentary on how juvenile he acts, but I'm not entirely sure. Louise is only like... 25, I think, and Rocco doesn't look like he's in his teens. I'm not sure. All I know is he looks a lot older by the time of GTA 5. Maybe he got some plastic surgery while in Vinewood that didn't exactly go as planned. Certainly looks like he might have, if you ask me. Also, Tony apparently has a bit of a crush on Rocco, which may have played a part in him selling the clubs to the Ancelotti's, though that's mostly just speculation on my part. In this next mission, Practice Swing, we have to go and work for Rocco because of Tony being indebted to him. In this case, it involves helping Rocco to interrogate some goon from a rival family to the Ancelotti's. All you have to actually do in this mission is shoot golf balls at the guy that Rocco's trying to intimidate. But for some reason, as Louise comments, he moves the golf cart every time because, well, it's a game. But it doesn't really make sense in the context of the story. Rocco is just an idiot and or an asshole, but we already knew that. And really, he's both. 
After the third hit, a bunch of rival mobsters show up and start attacking. You have to survive the initial attack and keep Rocco alive, and while the game tells you that you need to go down and save him immediately, I tend to like to stay up on this ledge and do as much killing from up here as I can because it's much safer. After you survive that initial phase, you do have to run down to Rocco and get into a golf cart though, at which point Tony will join you and start shooting back at the enemies. Then you just have to follow Rocco for a short while and not get killed, and then when you're finished, drive Tony home for another mission complete. This mission is also the one that introduces a new mechanic into GTA 4's world, that being golfing, of course. Now, there's no full-size course like there is in GTA 5, mostly because there just wouldn't be room for one in Liberty City, and also there wasn't one in the base game, but there is the driving range, which is fun enough, I guess. After that, I went and hung out with Armando and Enrique, which was perhaps a bit of a mistake. For one, Armando, and Enrique for that matter, are massive misogynists. Not a real surprise, I guess, but Luis joins in with them, which didn't exactly endear me to him, though I do still tend to enjoy his characterization from what I remember most of the time anyway. But it's been a long time since I've played, and well, let's just say I've changed quite a bit since then, so we'll see how my perspective on some of these characters changes with this playthrough. First, we grabbed a bite to eat, and then I decided to try out some of the new activities that have been added in the DLC, starting with Air Hockey, in which I played Armando. He kicked my ass in two different games. It's really hard, actually. After that, though, I played Enrique in golf, and I destroyed him, so I guess that made up for the loss in the first game, but when I exited the golf course, my car was gone. Not really a shocker. I should have known better than to bring my car on an activity, but still, I liked that car. Anyway, then we sat in the cab for about, I don't know, five minutes? while I wrote this part of the script, and then the cabbie just didn't move. Oh, I also forgot to mention that the cabbie hit me when we called the cab. Liberty City. Jeez. Luckily, I also had a blue saber that I picked up, so that made up for the loss of my car a little bit, but not entirely. Never bring your cars with you on activities. Or missions. Or or anywhere, really. Just, just never bring your car with you in GTA 4 or its DLCs ever. After that, I went to the internet cafe and decided to check Louise's emails. As it turns out, his sister seems really nice and seems to have a happy life with her husband somewhere. His brother, though, Ernesto, is a giant asshole. I wonder if it has anything to do with their mother. His sister Leda tries to encourage him to be nice to her, even though she knows that their mom is very hard on Louise. After that, I went and bought some more ammo, a new gun in the stubby shotgun, and a baseball bat. But at that point, I was literally completely out of money, so I couldn't even afford to take a cab to a new mission, and my car was severely damaged. So, I wanted to let it get repaired by driving far enough away from it. So, what I ended up doing was actually taking the train in GTA 4, which I never do. Until I realized I was on the wrong line... Damn it. So, I'm not 100% sure how this mechanic works, but sometimes Tony can either be at his apartment or at the club. I don't think, though, that there are, say, alternate versions of the cutscenes that will play depending on where you see him, but I could be wrong. But I certainly don't seem to recall that being the case. Anyway, the next mission is Chinese Takeout, one of the missions that crosses over with the Lost and Damned. So we meet up with a member of the Triads who wants Tony's help in clearing some licensing issues with, I assume, this building project. It isn't entirely clear to me what the license is for, or I just don't listen well enough, but neither Louise or Tony are either able to or interested in helping him, so the situation turns violent rather quickly, and before you know it, we're having to fight off a whole host of Triads as we escape the building though we now have access to one of the game's new weapons, the Assault SMG, 
which is quite fun to use. We then get a very good firefight down through the building. This is just more of GTA 4's great gunplay mechanics, so there's nothing really new here other than the new gun, which is, like I said, admittedly, a lot of fun to use. It's also not the only new gun in the game, and all the new guns are great, so there'll be plenty more fun to come. After we get out of the building, all we have to do is drive Tony home, and he happens to live around the corner, so that's it. Mission complete. On the way home, I get a call from a character who made an appearance in the last mission's opening cutscene, Yusef Amir, and unlocked the ability to go and do some missions for him. After that, I also went to do the LC cage fighting side missions to earn myself some extra money, but it isn't actually all that great for doing that. After that, it was finally time to do the club management side missions where Louise does, well, you know, his job. This involves working with the other club manager, Joni, and checking the club for people who have drank too much or are causing trouble and then dealing with them. Occasionally, Joni will call Louise to the office to, well, basically to harass him, so that's fun, but it's pretty clear to me why this was included, given the demographics of the franchise. While doing the regular club management, though, occasionally you have to do a sort of mini-mission, like this first one involving celebrity Clay P.G. Jackson. As it turns out, he's a closeted gay man, so... It's up to Louise to save him from being exposed by the paparazzi because, well, you know, it's 2008. <sighs> you find him in a car with his boyfriend being photographed by the paparazzi, or at least they're trying to take a photograph of them. So you have to get into the car and then drive out of there without hurting any of them, and then lose the paparazzi that pursue you. But again, you cannot hurt any of them or it will fail the mission. I think because that would probably cause some pretty bad publicity, I imagine. Then you just have to drop Clay and his boyfriend off at the Majestic Hotel, and mission complete. Like I said, these are very much mini missions, not full-on ones. After that, I decided to try once again at the LC Cage Fighters side activity, but it's a lot harder than I remember, and sadly, I ended up dying for the first time here. Damn it! I'm going to go back to missions. Next up was the first part of a two-part mission that deals with the celebrity critic, who I think is loosely based on Perez Hilton, the Celebinator. Really, all this mission is, is driving to Gracie Anzalotti's house. Oh yeah, remember her from the base game? She also gets introduced into the dynamic between Tony and Louise here, since she does come up in the missions that they share with Nico and Packy. But once we drop them off at her house, all we have to do is drive to the internet cafe and send the Celebrinator an email. The second part of the mission will happen later, and it's much more interesting. Oh, on my way back I found a new shafter. It was gold, but then I got it painted red and now it's back to the old one that I lost. Shh, just pretend. After that, I almost certainly did not spend an absurd amount of time trying desperately to win the stupid cage fights and end up dying four more times, and without beating it. Definitely not. I know I've beaten it before, and I seem to recall finding some kind of cheap strategy to do so, but I can't remember what that strategy was. So the whole thing was just really frustrating, and now I've died a whole lot, though not during any main missions, so... I guess that's something. For now, anyway. Next, it was on to another mission for Enrique and Armando, Corner Kids, which sees Louise attempting to help the two in their drug trade by driving them to a meet and serving as added credibility to the person they're going to deal with. Armando gives Louise an auto shoddy, another one of the new guns, just in case things go wrong, though. And of course, things will definitely go wrong. It wouldn't be much fun otherwise. At the meet, everything seems to be going normal, until we hear the police sirens, and it turns out that both Armando and or Enrique were tracked by the LCPD using their phones. It then turns into a rather intense shootout through several different sections of this industrial district, until you can reach a car, 
but not before being given an RPG to shoot down a helicopter just for a little bit of extra flair. I was initially actually using the auto shotty here, but given the distance most of the enemies have on you when the fighting begins, it makes a lot more sense for you to actually just shoot them with your new SMG if you have any ammo left, or using a regular assault rifle. I pretty much ended up doing the mission exclusively using the assault SMG, and it was relatively easy. Once the helicopter's down, you just have to jump into a car and drive them home. But this also unlocks another of the new side missions, doing drug missions for Armando and Enrique. When Luis tells them, they would be better off just stealing the product and then selling it directly, instead of doing deals like this that are more likely to get them in trouble with the law. We'll tackle drug wars a little bit later, though. After that, I decided to finally do a mission for Yusuf Amir at his luxury apartment. His first mission is honestly one that I've listed before as among the best in the series, but it is dead simple. Although, I guess that depends on how good you are with helicopters, and I happen to be pretty good. All you have to do is drive down to the docks and get into a boat in order to reach a different boat, a large yacht specifically, out in the middle of the water. The game does warn you that there are patrol boats that will try to stop you, but there's only one as far as I could tell, and it does absolutely nothing to actually stop you. It was stupid easy to just avoid the patrol boat and then jump out and climb aboard the yacht. Once aboard, there's no need to actually, say, go to the other end or fight off the guards. You literally just walk up, get in the helicopter, and then fly away. But before you can land it and deliver it to Yusuf, he will ask you to kill everybody on board. Because as it turns out, they're all super shady arms dealers, and that does make sense. I mean, why else would you have a military-grade helicopter on the back of your yacht? So, turn the helicopter around, and then you get to have some real fun just holding down the fire buttons. And because this is GTA 4, not 5, you have unlimited rockets and never really have to reload, so you can literally just hold down the A button to fire the machine gun and tap the X button for rockets and just position your helicopter to do maximum damage. After about three passes avoiding the rockets being fired at you from the yacht, I destroy the yacht and watch a little cutscene, which is pretty satisfying. The final part of the mission is just to destroy three of the arms dealers, who somehow manage to escape in smaller boats, which is a little bit trickier, since they're on the move. And they actually also fire rockets at you constantly, so be careful. Once they all die, you can just drop the helicopter off at one of Yusuf's helipads, and that's a mission complete. Definitely a fun one, but maybe it's just because I've gotten so good with helicopters over the years, but it's not a challenging one at all. Still, tons of fun. After that, I did the game's first random encounter with a very creepy French man on the corner of one of the main streets in downtown Algonquin. All he wanted me to do was drive him to a seemingly not-so-above-board massage parlor, but thankfully, Louise at least had the dignity to turn him down, in terms of joining him, but that's all you have to do. Give him a ride and that's it. You, then it was back to doing some mild club management, even though I started my shift at 4 a.m., which in real life would mean, you know, one of the shortest nightclub shifts ever, considering most places close at 2, but Mason at 9 is a late, late night place, clearly. The concept of this is fun enough, but the actual club management part is kind of just boring and occasionally a little bit gross. And the only fun part to be had here is the little side missions that you get each night, but you do have to suffer through the club management part first to get to those. So this mission ended up being just having to get some food for a celebrity, Miss Carrie McIntosh. There's some more, let's say, dated jokes in here that frankly make me pretty uncomfortable, but in terms of the actual mission, all we do is drive to get some food, and then drive it back, while being harassed by Miss McIntosh's assistant, who was very, very impatient. 
no, seriously. She calls like three times within the space of like, I don't know, 10 minutes, even in game. Because of how late I started this mission, it ended up being basically midday by the time I got the food. So I guess I kind of do understand her being so impatient. I mean, she's been waiting basically half a day for it. And I actually end up failing this mission because she literally wants you to speed across town. Very, very annoying. I have no idea if I get a chance to do it again, but frankly I don't want to, so I hope not. After that, it was back to doing even more LC cage fights because why the hell not? The first couple rounds are always really easy, but it just gets ridiculous once the enemies with weapons show up, because it's down to a matter of luck it seems, if you're able to disarm them or not. And if you don't, well, you're pretty much screwed. Like, seriously, one or two hits from any of the weapons, and you're usually just done, because there's no way you're going to recover enough health or defeat enough fighters with the amount of health you lose. It's just ridiculous. Thankfully, you do at least get a tiny bit of health back when you win a round, but it's usually not enough to make a difference. If you can get your hands on a knife, though, for any round, especially in the first part, you're usually pretty good. Finally, this time I did it though, and thank god, because that was really freaking hard, and I died so many times. Again, I haven't even died during a mission, but I have died, I think, six or maybe seven times doing these? At least it's over. The reward for it is a mere $4,000, which is not bad, I guess, but money isn't super important in these games, especially as you'll see later on when we start doing the drug wars. So, after that, I decided to do more club management missions, but unfortunately, that far too often literally means walking from one location to the other, and then just looking around. This time, for a special custom mission, we have to deal with some kind of prince from England, I think? Some form of stuck-up royalty. He asks us to go and help him pick up some ladies for the night, so we just have to drive him, pick up the girls, and then drive them to a private location. When we finished up there, there was still time to go back to the club and do more, so I figured Louise was finally going to do a full shift. Our second celebrity mission of the night, or I guess just side mission, is one for a character that appears in GTA V. So in other words, she actually made her debut appearance here. It's Poppy Mitchell. She's being harassed by photographers, and so Louise and Desi, the regular doorman's solution, is to use a stolen fire truck. How very, very subtle, and not at all legally dubious, but definitely very GTA. Getting rid of all of them, you then have to drive her home in the fire truck. How classy. Parked the fire truck outside of Tony's apartment and went inside with my suit on for a new mission after that. In this one, we get to meet Tony's boyfriend, Evan Moss, who he's mentioned a few times and is, well, a giant tool. In this cutscene, we get to see how much Louise actually cares about Tony, and it's kind of sweet. Well, it's sweet until it gets violent, but I suppose he is trying to keep Tony from hurting himself. Tough love? So, Rocco Pelosi wanted Tony to do a literal terrorism for the sake of their partnership, but Louise recognizes that Tony isn't sober or smart enough to do it himself, so Louise is going to handle it. In other words, we're going to handle it. I mean, I'm going to handle it. Screw it. Here I go to blow up a freaking train. Well, it's not just a train, actually. There are a number of different targets, the first being a crane. Yeah, this crane that's been in the game since GTA 4 and has probably annoyed a lot of people because of its placement on one of the main roads. Well, not anymore. Although sadly this doesn't actually clear this part of the road for afterwards, which does make sense, there would probably be a lengthy investigation before anything could actually happen, so. But yeah, I, I do gotta love how this game completely underestimates the severity of doing something like this. People would die, like probably several people, and I mean civilians, 
Now, I realize that Luis doesn't have a problem with killing some people, like other violent people, but like most times that the GTA franchise asks the player to commit literal terrorism, it just doesn't really take into account how dangerous and destructive this act would actually be, even for their own motives, or how much exposure this would bring in a post-9-11 world. The police would be on both of them so quickly after committing the very first act that it would defeat the point entirely, but whatever. Something that is cool about the train cutscene is that it appears to trigger wherever you actually do it. Although I'm not 100% sure about this, maybe I just happen to trigger it at the spot where you usually do? Whatever the case, the final target is a plane, so it's off to the airport. This section is timed though, because the plane will leave at a specific time, so you have to make sure that you get off of the train tracks quickly so that you don't miss the flight. I ended up taking the tracks a little bit too far though, all the way into Dukes in fact, and then as I was leaving I ended up getting the cops on me because, well, I'm impatient. So I had to make sure that I lost them before I got to the airport, otherwise it was going to be even more frustrating. Actually, it turns out that little distraction was enough to make me lose, sadly. But thankfully, when you use the mission's replay system for this, you also get to start from the third objective, and not have to do all three again. I think this is a change-slash-improvement from the base game as far as I can remember, and it's basically how it would be done in GTA V, minus the need to actually go into your phone after dying. On the bright side, though, when you have to restart a mission, one like this anyways, it means that you get full refills on the ammo that the game supplies you for that mission. Which means I got to have full sticky bombs once again. Very nice. The only thing left to do in this mission is to lose the cops because, you know, you just committed terrorism. Though, for some reason, only on the third time, not the first two, did the police actually show up. Better late than never, I guess? Something I noticed about this DLC this time around is the fact that the gun stores still only sell the original GTA Arsenal. They don't sell any of the new guns from GTA Lost in the Damned or from this one. Now, I do think you can get those when you do have a good enough relationship with either Armando or Enrique, one of the friends. I can't remember which, but I don't remember if that's actually the case. So we'll see. I then spent a bunch of time messing around with the Zolika mod menu that I use for filming B-roll in GTA 4. It allows me to do things like have custom colors for my cars that aren't normally available, and even turn the pay and sprays into LS Customs with a rudimentary menu. First person camera, hard mode, etc, etc. As fun as it would be to continue the rest of the playthrough with some of these things, the only thing I'm going to be keeping is the custom cars, since that doesn't really affect the gameplay at all. Or at least, all I'm going to do is customize my car colors, and not any of the features or adding better handling, engines, etc. None of that. But maybe that would be a fun idea for another video. Anyways. Next, I decided to tackle one of the new side missions, Drug Wars, which you do for Armando and Enrique after the mission Corner Kids. These might be the best part of the DLC, honestly. As far as I know, they do repeat eventually, but what you get is still a lot of fun. They're very open-ended missions, in the style of something you might find in GTA Online, but minus the completely unfair AI, and you know, all the other bullshit of GTA Online. So you just get freeform GTA goodness instead. The first one I do is called The Stick Up, and involves us going to a parking lot where a deal is taking place. It's then up to us to eliminate all of the rival dealers, and as soon as they're all down, we take the stash and just have to drive to our drop-off location. Armando and Enrique will shoot back at the baddies chasing us as we leave, keeping things interesting right to the end. It's overall relatively simple, but still, lots of fun. I think I'm going to do all of these now. Well, maybe not all of them, but... I definitely think I'm going to do a bunch, until they start getting boring or repetitive. There are 25 of them after all, and I know for sure they are not all 100% unique. Not the concepts anyways. 
They might even be radiant. Though, I guess not, because there is a limited number of them. So I think there are a number of different types of scenarios for these, but as far as I can tell, a lot of them do seem to have unique dialogue. At least, so far. These are definitely among my favorite things I've ever done in any of the GTA 4 DLCs or the base game. They're just so much fun, and utilize the best parts of GTA 4's gameplay. Driving mechanics, shooting mechanics, and the amazing Euphoria engine that makes both of those things so much fun. The added unique story to each of these is just a little bonus on top. I love it. Minus, you know, having to spend time with Armando and Enrique, whom I definitely don't love. The next variation of these that I discovered was the ones called the Hijack. Now, the first one I had to do involved stealing a boat that was just sitting off the coast. And then all we had to do was lose the cops once we got in the boat, which was significantly easier than I expected it to be. And then finally just drive the boat back to a drop-off location, but this one was definitely not nearly as fun, but still good. The third variation was called the Stash. As far as I could tell, this was basically the exact same as the Stick Up. There's a group of rival gangsters that you have to attack, take their drugs, and then drive away after surviving a rather intense gunfight. I'm sure there will be more variations of each of these for different scenarios, but as far as I can tell right now, it was the same as the first type. One of the coolest parts, probably the coolest part about these missions, besides the gameplay, is the fact that you get to learn little tidbits about Luis's life through Luis's interactions with Armando and Enrique. He will open up about his brother and sister, his mom, his time in prison, and a bunch of other things. I did start to notice, though, during this last mission that a lot of the dialogue does start to repeat rather quickly, which is a little bit disappointing, but not entirely all that surprising, considering there are 25. I did a few more of the Drug Wars missions, but I was starting to get bored, so back to main missions for a little bit. But, actually, a main mission for Armando and Enrique, so not all that different in concept. This one, Clocking Off, is, like a lot of missions in this DLC, relatively simple in concept, but really just a lot of fun. In fact, doing this one immediately after having done several of the Drug Wars missions, this was basically just a slightly more elaborate version of one of those, with a little bit more story. We go with the two down to the docks for a meeting to collect some product. Armando stays up top to watch over things, while me and Enrique go down to inspect the product and then, shockingly, once we get to the bottom, a rival gang shows up to steal everything. So then we just have to fight our way back up to where we started, killing about three waves of enemies until we finally get rid of them all and can jump back into a car and bring it back to a lockup. The police don't even see us as we leave, which is really bad police work, but hey, I'm not complaining. There's also no fighting on the way back, which is a bit of a shame though, but I was so low on health, it really wasn't that annoying because I did not want to have to do the mission again. Park the car in the lockup and that's a mission complete. That's also the final mission for these two clowns, not counting the drug wars, so yay. This video and all videos on my channel are brought to you in large part by the wonderful support of my YouTube members and by patrons on Patreon.com. An extra special thank you to my executive producer and Walkerville tier supporters, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, King GTA 15, Die Castinator, and Michael Vandenberg. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is also brought to you by Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, and Die Castinator's channel, All About Diecast Cars. I release all videos a little early to all supporters, and give you any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos produced while you are pledged, get access to a small patron-slash-members-only Discord server where you can easily speak with me 
or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express how grateful I am to you all. Sign up as a YouTube member today, or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. Thank you so much for watching. So, I thought it was finally time I did work for the other person that Tony owes money to. Yeah, remember in the very first mission that I said he sold the business to two separate people? One of them was the Ancelotti crime family, but the other one was the older brother to Brucey from GTA 4, Maury Kibbutz. He's twice as arrogant, five times as violent, and at least three feet shorter. But he does at least seem capable of backing up his words with action, at least a little bit more than Brucey. But he's still just such a giant asshole that it doesn't really matter. So, because Tony is in debt to him, that means, by extension, Louise is too. So, he wants us to help him take over some rival business that presumably sells guns, but it isn't exactly clear. So, we once again, just like the last mission, drive down to the docks and have to fight off this rival gang of arms dealers? Now, this mission does have a guy who will start shooting at you with rockets, actually, but thankfully he's a very bad shot. And I bought a sniper rifle recently, which makes light work of most of the enemies here. We then have to jump into a boat and chase after three more guys, and the game supplies us with some sticky bombs, telling us to blow up their boats with them. The problem is, in Ballad of Gay Tony, sticky bombs are kind of hard to see on the surface that they land on. Like, in general, I have a hard time knowing where they actually went, and in the water this is twice as hard. I end up blowing up one of the boats with the sticky bombs, only for the other two to get away, forcing me to do a restart. But thankfully there is a checkpoint once again, so we just have to do the boat section again and not the whole thing. This time though, I simply use my SMG to fire at each of the boats with minimal pushback from them. And then once the third one is destroyed, we just have to drop Mori off, and that's a mission complete. Then I went back to doing the Drug Wars missions, and got a slightly new one called the Convoy. And this one we have to find a single car, not much of a convoy, kill the occupants, and then steal it to take it back to the regular drop-off point. Something kind of neat here is that, even though I shot up the tires of the vehicle, after I got inside, they miraculously refilled themselves, I guess. So that's kind of neat, although it would have made more sense for me to actually take a hit from doing the damage, but whatever. Would have made things a little bit more challenging, but also a bit more annoying, so take your pick. After that, I decided to do another one of these Strangers and Freaks missions for a woman named Margot. She'd actually sent several emails to Louise earlier, but honestly... I don't really know how much I feel like talking about this mission in detail. It makes light of a rather serious subject for me that I'd rather not touch on, so I'll leave it at this. Margot has a problem. She has many problems, in fact, but the most serious one is that she's obsessed with Louise, despite him not being interested. So, we have to drive her to the hospital and drop her off, and that's it. I really hope I never have to see her again, because... I do not want to talk about what they are trying to comment on with her, because it just isn't funny. Then I did another stick-up mission for the Drug Wars thread, and I learned something. You don't actually have to worry about where Armando and Enrique are when you are delivering product, or whatever it is you're doing. So you don't have to worry about making sure that they get in the car with you, say, because they will literally just teleport behind you, so long as you aren't, you know, looking behind yourself. But you can totally see this happening on the minimap, and it's quite amusing. Also, where we deliver them drugs is actually Huang Li's place from Chinatown Wars. A little bit of trivia for you there. During the next convoy mission, I learned two things. One, there's never an actual convoy. It's literally always just one car that you have to steal, which is disappointing to say the least. The second thing I learned is that if Armando and Enrique die, at least... As long as it's close to when you complete the mission, it doesn't matter. 
I accidentally stuck a bomb to one of their cars and then drove into the ending of the mission marker. And right at that moment, their cars blew up, leading to a cutscene without either of them speaking, which was kind of funny. But I still passed, so yay. After that, I did one more stick-up variation, but it was during this one that I realized that there's really nothing new to see at this point, and I certainly don't care about achievements or anything like that, so I think I'm done with these. Then I did another Strangers and Freaks mission for that French guy we ran into earlier. Turns out his name is Arnaud. Well, he got himself into a bit of a pickle when a pimp decided to assault him and take his wallet. Louise is apparently fond of him. I'm definitely not, but sure, whatever, I guess I'll help him out. It turned into quite the extensive police chase when the pimp ended up stopping right at the crossings from Bohan into Broker. I had to shoot him, which means the cops got interested, which means I had to shoot them too. And the next thing you know, the two of us are escaping a three-star wanted level. But he's a wild guy, so he actually enjoyed the whole thing. Once the cops were finally gone, Louise said we were going to drop him off around the corner, which was in reality all the way back in Bohan, quite a ways from where we actually were. But that's all, and as far as I know, that's the last we'll ever see of him. Finally, though, it was time to tackle another main story mission, Boulevard Baby. In this one, Rocco Pelosi wants us to go and hit on the girlfriend of another club owner around the corner from Masonette 9, called Bahama Mamas. I think it's just meant to make the owner, a guy named Vic, jealous because Rocco's family wants to own that club too. I'm not exactly sure. And Vic is supposed to be in Las Venturas right now, so I'm not also sure how he would find out other than Rocco telling him, I guess? Anyway, clearly I wasn't listening. When we get there, we have to actually do a little bit of a dancing mini game, one that eventually returned in the nightclub update for GTA Online but it's a lot more annoying to do properly here, or it certainly was the first couple times that I tried it. But then, somehow, it just started working again. I swear to God, I was doing the same thing the first time that I was doing the second time, but it just wasn't working until I looked it up for some reason. When you do finally get the dancing minigame done with, the girl, Monique, will take Louise to the back of the club and pleasure him. But as it turns out, Vic is not only not in Las Venturas, but he also hires some really stupid bouncers who can't follow simple instructions. So, pretty quickly, things turn violent. And then we have to kill Vic and escape the club. I did my best here to not kill any other club members other than the guards, but that can prove a lot easier said than done sometimes, and by the end, I was down to my last sliver of health. Thankfully, though, it's another situation where the cops show up at the absolute worst time. For them. So, I managed to escape right at the end without having to deal with them at all. I don't even think you can get the cops here for what you do. I think it's scripted for them to not go after you. You know, unless you start shooting at them or something. But either way, that's another mission complete. Next, I decided to tackle another mission for Yusuf Amir. High Dive is a really fun mission, but I will admit, I've tried to wrap my head around exactly what the hell happens in it, and I still can't. Not fully. So, Yusuf wants us to go and hang out with him and pretend that we're friends, and then meet up with two of his business partners. On the way there, he calls them, but they're acting suspicious, so he asks Luis to go and meet them first, and make sure everything is cool. So, we go to Rotterdam Tower, the GTA 4 Universe's version of the Empire State Building, and we have to take an elevator up to the observation deck. We meet the two men, but they're still acting very, very strange, for some reason. So then Louise immediately becomes hostile, and throws one of them off the building. It seems like a really hasty move, but the real reason was just to see it, because it does kind of look cool. He lands on a freaking taxi cab. The other guy starts running away, climbing up to the very top of the tower. So now I think I understand what this mission is for. It's just for a really cool set piece. And admittedly, 
one that I think a lot of people were upset we didn't get to see in GTA 4 or Lost and Damned, namely, a reason for climbing the tallest building in the city. But it still doesn't fully make sense to me. As soon as Ahmed runs away and starts climbing, a whole bunch of new skies show up to attack us. So, I think what it was is that Ahmed and the other guy were trying to put Yusuf behind bars by making a deal with law enforcement. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, yeah, that does explain why so many cops show up so quickly. But it does not explain why Ahmed felt the need to hand Louise a parachute at the very top. Like, dude, why didn't you use it yourself? It's also only then that he finally admits that there was a wiretap, to which Louise responds by scaring him off of the top. Then all that's left is getting to parachute to the bottom, which is actually a mechanic that was reintroduced in The Ballad of Gay Tony that wasn't present in either the base game or in The Lost and Damned, that a lot of people missed from San Andreas. Once you land with the parachute, though, the cops stop chasing you immediately, so that's it. Mission complete. This was really fun and a great dynamic set piece, but it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I guess it kind of does, but I don't know, it still feels like a bit of a stretch to get to this set piece. The part where Ahmed climbs up doesn't make any sense anyway, and it's dumb that you can't just shoot him as he's climbing without failing the mission. I guess because Louise doesn't technically know why he's running yet, but pretty sure he could have figured it out. I mean, even I kind of did eventually, and I'm not very smart at all, so... Doing this mission also unlocks base jumping activities across the city, which is cool, I guess. But more importantly, it finally unlocks Armando as somebody you can buy guns from and parachutes. Which means, now I can finally buy the new guns that are available in the DLC, instead of having to buy the old ones from the old gun stores in the base game. Actually, now that I think about it, there is something else new that was introduced in that mission, the auto shotgun with explosive rounds. I knew I remembered this gun being a lot more fun than it was the first time around. And admittedly, this is a really, really cool feature. Possibly one of the most fun guns in the arsenal between the base game, the Lost and Damned, and this DLC, so yay. Then it was time for another mission for Mori Kibbutz. A very simple one, but a fun one. A race. This ain't checkers. So, Mori makes a bet with Louise that if he manages to beat him in a multi-stage race, and does one more favor for him after that, he'll forgive Tony of all of his debts. So first, we have to go up in a helicopter in a cutscene. Sadly, we don't get to actually race the helicopters, which was kind of implied. And then, when we start, we have to parachute down to a group of boats. You get multiple choices, but I'm so good I managed to land in one of the boats directly. And then you have to race around the coast for a little bit, before reaching the abandoned casino, where you do the final mission of the base game. Then you get to jump into one of four different cars, and this time there's actually Nitro, which is pretty cool. It's just unfortunate that this feature doesn't return afterwards. Then it's just one more short race in the cars, until you reach Middle Park, at which point, Mori pretends like he always wanted to lose, of course. But I think the more surprising thing is that he's actually a man of his word. So, that means only one more mission for him, and everything will be square. And I think it's another race, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Then it was right back to do another Yusuf mission, and one of the more fun missions in the entire GTA 4 saga, I would say. Caught with your pants down. So, almost all of Yusuf's missions are an answer to things that were left out of the base game. The buzzard attack chopper, was an answer to there not being a more aggressive chopper, like the hunter from the old games. The last mission was an answer to there not being parachutes anymore, and this one is an answer to there not being tanks, since there's no longer an army that comes after you when you get to six stars. So in this one, Yusuf wants us to get our hands on a noose tank. This involves us first meeting Yusuf in the middle of Star Junction, after he ditches his father in a helicopter. And then first, we have to fly the helicopter. It's never explained how Louise can fly it since he's never had any pilot training. Although, I think there is a throwaway line later that Tony somehow at some unspecified point paid for a weekend pilot license for Louise. But anyways. 
then we fly out towards where there is a noose tank being transported into the city, and immediately Yusuf takes control of the helicopter again, despite his weird excuse why he couldn't do it a second earlier. Then we have to do the most annoying part of the mission, which is snipe out the four hooks holding the tank from the helicopter. I don't know why, but I'm really bad at this. But once I finally get it, it drops onto the freeway, and we have to parachute down to get inside. Then all you have to do is do as much damage as possible to all pursuing cops until they decide it's just not worth throwing any more guys at you. Unfortunately though, this is not like the old Rhino Tank, it's more like the Rhino Tank from San Andreas, which means it can in fact be destroyed. So I actually failed it the first time and had to retry. The second time though was a lot better, and eventually they don't just actually straight up give up, they just reduce your wanted level to one star. So I almost feel bad for those few cops that continue to pursue me, but you know, I didn't want to get even more stars, so I just drove away. The tank is, in fact, a lot of fun, but I will say it's not nearly as much fun as any of the tanks from the old games. So, it's nice to finally have it, but I don't even think they'll send it after you when you get a big wanted level in the game, should you, say, go on a rampage. I could be wrong about that. Maybe I'll test it out later to find out, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. You then simply deliver it to Yusuf at his building site at the end of Algonquin, and somehow he just keeps it and no one ever comes after him. I'm pretty sure doing something like this would attract more attention than, I don't know, literally anything else ever done in the city's history, but I guess not, so Yusuf just gets away with it. I suppose it's because he has money? I don't know. Next up, I decided to do what I think is the last Strangers and Freaks mission for Louise, meeting a girl that he's hooked up with before at Mason at 9, Daisy Cash Coos. Actually, it turns out there is one more Strangers and Freaks encounter after this, one that I really hated, but we'll get to that in a little bit. God, this lovely mission is just a reminder that this indeed did take place in 2008, a time when America was still not fully accepting of LGBTQ people, even gay men. You know, kind of like today. So much so that people are willing to go to elaborate lengths to prove to the world especially Vinewood, that they aren't gay. We have to hunt down this guy, Chad? Chaz? And follow him by looking at what he's bleating, the GTA Universe's version of Twitter. I guess we'll call it Zed now, but this man is apparently very, very quick. Because every time we show up to where he's supposed to be, he's moved on to somewhere new. By the time we finally catch up with him in the middle of Star Junction, well he's already decided to display his little interaction with Daisy to prove his straightness. But Louise has no sympathy for her because, well, she's kind of a bitch. Still, super messed up. Now it's finally time for the final Mori mission, number three, a juxtaposition to the mission number one from the base game. This is yet another very, very simple mission, but one with at least a very satisfying cutscene at the end. So, Mori said last time that we had to do one more thing for him if we beat him in the race. I guess the thing that he wanted us to do was another race. I don't know, it seems kind of weird that this is the thing he wanted us to do, and not some other job for him, but whatever. So, this time we will go with Mori and Brucey to do a little drive through parts of Algonquin. Pretty quickly though, the cops will show up and act as a set piece because they don't actually chase you. In fact, most of the race takes place exclusively on the coast of the islands, and the police never actually became an issue. You drive for a little while, and come to the hardest part, which is making these three jumps onto three little different tugboats. Barges? But once you finish that, it's over. But then you do get the best part of the Mori mission thread, Brucey punching him in the face. Yeah! Yeah! Are you yeah! kidding? Yeah! <laughs> Sorry, Maury, I forgot, man. Never, never in the face. Oh, come on. This is, this is top work up here. You know that I got a weak and zapped up. Okay. Oh, just, just, just don't tell mom, okay? Okay? <laughs> okay, okay. 
okay, okay, just, but you're gonna take me home. After that came the actual final Strangers and Freaks encounter, a second encounter with Margot, the stalker lady. Look, I am not going to talk much about this encounter because it's actually one of the darkest things I think is in the entire GTA franchise. It makes me very, 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 very uncomfortable. But let's just say that Margot doesn't make it. And also, Louise proves that he is a real piece of crap. I'm not saying Margot isn't definitely in need of some help, or that Louise should do what she wants him to do, but he is just awful here. Truly and utterly awful. Like this? This encounter made me hate Louise, honestly. Like, genuinely hate him. Like, I think he might be one of my least favorite protagonists in the entire series now because of this. So, yay. If you've played, you know what I'm talking about, and if you haven't, well, I don't know, make some assumptions or look it up online, but I'm not talking about this any further in any detail. I didn't even really want to include the fact that I had to do this encounter at all, but yeah, I hated this. I hated this more than the encounter with Eddie Lowe, more than anything I can think of from recent memory in any of the games. This made me want to stop playing. Moving back to Tony missions... Next, we have one of the few missions that crosses over with the Lost and Damned, Frosting on the Cake. So, in this mission, we get to see Tony and Louise's half of selling the diamonds that you get to see first in the first DLC. In that, you play as a Johnny and have to actually ambush the meat, and then kill Evan, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So, yeah, we're going to go buy some diamonds. That is very, very poorly explained to be a way for Tony to pay back Rocco, Maybe. It isn't very clear, it doesn't make much sense, and honestly, it kind of feels like it was thrown together last minute to sort of make sense, but whatever, once again. So, Evan comes with us, even though in the cutscene he said he wouldn't because Louise told him to screw off, but continuity doesn't really matter much in these games sometimes. This isn't even the only time in this DLC that the ending to a cutscene is pretty much immediately contradicted by what you actually do in the mission. When we finally get down to the docks, Tony starts acting completely differently. Well, not completely, but definitely weird compared to how he's portrayed in the rest of the game. A lot campier. He does this also later on in another cutscene that is crossover with the base game, and the reason for this is because they had characterized Tony and voiced him in both the base game and the DLC before writing the full script for this DLC, clearly. It is a little bit jarring, considering how much different Tony's demeanor is at the drop of a hat, but whatever. It still kind of makes sense, especially because both he and Evan are very, very high, so it's fine. Once we get ambushed, then we just have to throw sticky bombs at all of the lost MC chasing us as we flee, while somebody else drives. This is stupid easy. It's fun, don't get me wrong, but it's just not challenging at all. Maybe it's because I'm so used to doing this or doing things like this in these kinds of games, but I literally at no point had any real challenge whatsoever. It just felt like one big set piece. A very elaborate and fun one to watch, but still it barely felt like I was actually doing anything at all. Just blowing up a bunch of bikers chasing us. The game also supplies you with infinite bombs, which is cool, but again, completely eliminates any challenge there might have been of actually trying to use your bombs effectively. God forbid you didn't get to do exactly what Rockstar wants you to do in their on-rails shooter, sorry, sorry, open world game. Am I starting to sound bitter? Maybe, and it might sound like I'm being a little bit harsh, but that's because I am. I still very much enjoy a lot of GTA 4, but... The things that I tend to enjoy the most are things like the Drug Wars missions, which gives you a certain amount of freedom while also providing you with some form of a challenge. But there are so many missions in the base game of GTA 4, in The Lost and Damned, and in this DLC which feel like they're just little movies. And don't get me wrong, the scenes are fun to watch and fun to participate in, but there's no real way to fail. Like, barely at all. I guess you could accidentally blow yourself up or take too much damage from the bikers, but as long as you come with armor on, you'll be fine. 
Or at least, I don't think I've ever failed this mission, but maybe that's just me. It just doesn't feel like a game. It feels like a long cutscene that you kind of get to participate in. GTA 4, Heavy Rain. And I don't know, I really tend to like games that take advantage of the fact that they are a unique medium, like, say, Fallout New Vegas. And I do still very much enjoy The Ballad of Gay Tony, but usually not for the actual things you're doing in the missions, because a lot of them are like this. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Also, Evan dies, as you learn in The Lost and Damned, and as I spoiled just a few minutes ago. But it isn't exactly clear how Tony and Louise know for sure that he's dead. He bleats just as he's killed, but he doesn't actually confirm in any way that he's dead. It's not like somebody takes a picture of his body, or somebody calls Tony to tell him, or Tony hears him on the phone as he's dying, but all of a sudden, both Louise and Tony are just 100% sure that he died. I don't know, it seems kind of convoluted, and again, like it's trying desperately to fit the already established narrative of what happens in the base game and the first DLC. But whatever, Tony leaves a little bit upset, but don't worry because immediately after this, we will be starting a completely different mission that completely changes the tone. Yeah, so next we almost immediately have to start the second half of a mission that we started a long time ago, but it really feels like it should have been done way before frosting on the cake. The second half of Blog This. We go to meet Tony and the Celebrinator at a helicopter. The helicopter that Yusef Amir gave us earlier. Well, he never gave it to us, but we're borrowing it from him since now Tony is good friends with him because of all the things Louise has done for him. So, for some reason, the Celebrinator agrees to go with Tony and Louise in the helicopter and fly around the city, despite the fact that he's hostile to both of them. How is he this stupid? I guess it really doesn't matter, though, because you do get to do something relatively fun in this. That is, beat the crap out of Irish Perez Hilton, and then throw him out of a helicopter. The only sad part is then you have to catch him while parachuting down and save him. Afterwards, he soils himself, too. So again, not very difficult. In fact, it's difficult to fail this mission, in my opinion, like a lot of missions in this DLC so far. But at least we got to be really mean to the GTA Universe's version of a truly awful human being. After that, I decided to do some more club management, but I kind of regret it. The amount of time that you have to spend just walking back and forth in the club or going to see Joni for some more ridiculous cutscenes, all just to have some very silly, usually boring extra mission just doesn't feel worth it. I don't know, maybe I'm just becoming jaded at the whole GTA 4 formula at this point, but I'm not sure. All I know is I'm not having nearly as much fun as I remember having back in the day. That's obviously for a variety of reasons, but I don't know, these feel so formulaic, lazy, and just kind of boring. Shortly after that, I got a call from Ray Bulgarin, so it was off to do missions for one of the worst people in the entire series. His first mission, Going Deep, involves us having to take out the personal security team of a man named Marky Ashvili, who owns the Liberty City Rampage hockey team that Ray desperately wants to buy. It's all very convoluted, but what it all amounts to is having to go to a parking garage, plant some sticky bombs on Ray's car, and then wait for the news team to arrive, where they plan to plant some evidence and get him arrested. But as soon as they go to actually plant said evidence, we detonate the bombs that we've planted. I actually planted bombs all over the entire garage, on various cars, and made the whole first part of the encounter a lot easier. This is a rather intense but actually failable and fun gunfight. The only complaint I suppose I have is that a lot of the enemies have a ridiculous amount of health, for no reason at all. I guess these SWAT soldiers having larger health pools does make sense, but what about these regular undercover cops? I guess maybe they're wearing bulletproof armor under their clothes, but I don't know, it seems ridiculous the amount of ammo you actually have to pump into them for them to go down. Luckily though, I did have two RPG shots left, just enough, so I was able to make the encounter a little bit shorter. But like I said, this is actually failable, and you do actually have to pay attention to pass it. It's not incredibly difficult, but it is at least fun and engaging. 
then it was right back to do a Tony mission, not so fast. This is yet another mission which crosses over with both the base game and with the Lost and Damned. In fact, it's one of the few that does both. It's the deal at the Libertonian. All that we have to do here as Louise is go and grab Yusuf's chopper, which Louise asks to borrow, and which Yusuf has also painted solid gold, of course, and then just fly to the museum to see the cutscene that we've seen twice before. Well, because Louise can't actually be anywhere in the building during the firefight, the cutscene shows us ambushing Nico and Johnny, and then taking the diamonds from, I think, Isaac, or maybe Jacob? But then as soon as the cutscene ends, we are immediately right in front of the ladder that we have to climb up, and then all we have to do is get into the helicopter and presumably fly away. I wonder if you decide to turn around here, can you find Johnny and Nico and, like, kill them and fail the mission that way? I don't know. Now, I thought I was going to be extra disappointed that this mission was literally nothing but a cutscene and a set piece. But, as it turns out, there is something you actually have to do, which requires some effort. You have to blow up three pursuing police helicopters, the Annihilators from the base game, using your new fancy buzzard. But this really isn't all that difficult, however, it is a lot of fun. After all, the buzzard in this game is absolutely OP, and I love it. In fact, I did such a good job that I actually got my first and only legit 100% on the mission screen at the end, when we land the helicopter and hand the diamonds back to Tony. They will come back one more time, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Then it was back to another Ray mission, dropping in. So, because Marky Ashvili did not sell the hockey team to Ray after we killed all of his noose team, now we have to kill him. I find it hilarious that Louis says that he will not do the job for Ray, and then all it takes for him to change his mind is Ray saying, I'm telling you what to do. In fact, in the very last mission, he says this. So who you want me to kill, boss? And later on, in another mission, says this. Well, I like killing for money. So, um, contradiction much? But then he insists in this mission that he's not anybody's assassin, and that it's too much for him, even though, you know, he's already done terrorism and killed many, many people for many different criminals. Louise is almost, maybe even more of a hypocrite than Victor Vance, and just as self-righteous. So anyway, we have to go with Timur to a helicopter, and then fly all the way up to above the MeTV building where Marky works. Once we get to high enough, Timur will take control of the helicopter, and we have to then parachute down onto the roof, at which point they immediately know we're there, which feels like it defeats the whole stealth approach that I thought we were going for, but whatever. Then we get an actual difficult encounter with the enemies through the hallways. In fact, this might be the hardest mission that we've had so far, that actually asks you to pay attention throughout the fight. Especially this one elevator where I almost got killed, because I didn't realize there would be enemies waiting for me at the bottom. But it isn't too difficult, and ultimately not very long before we reach Marky in his main room, and then have to take out all of his guards. You can just shoot him for an easy victory here, but he has a special execution-style ending if you shoot him in front of the window. And it is quite satisfying, especially given what he says to you immediately before you kill him, which makes him all the more cathartic to eliminate. Then we have to hop out of the window and parachute down once again. Although I'm not sure where we got the second parachute, and land on a truck that Tamur is driving. This is usually the part that I fail, but I actually got it all done the very first time. Mission complete. We're getting towards the end here now. Then it was time to follow up one of the DLC's most fun missions, with its literal most boring one, Ladies' Night. By this point, Gracie Ancelotti has been kidnapped by Nico and Packy McCreary, so we then have to go into a helicopter and follow Packy from his house in Dukes, all the way to the spot that they move her to in Alderney. Now, I'm not sure how Packy is this dumb, but the game doesn't actually require you to fly too high above him. It does want you to at least try and not fly directly above him, but the fact that he doesn't see you or become suspicious when you're flying immediately above his house as he leaves is, well, an indictment on how intelligent Packy really is. 
But the rest of this mission is just following Packy's car as he takes a ridiculous route back to the safe house in Alderney. That's it. Very, very boring. One out of ten. Would not play again. So then it was on to the final Ray Bulgarin mission in the crosshairs. So we go meet Ray at his house and he is visibly upset. Tamur isn't there though and he asks us to go and meet him and back him up. But not before mentioning the diamonds that we've dealt with in both DLCs and the base game. And if you've been paying attention you would know that Ray is the owner of said diamonds and is probably not going to be too happy about our attempt to steal them twice. So, when we do get to the spot Timur is supposedly waiting for us at, it turns out to be an ambush, and Ray has had the original seller of the diamonds, the chef, whom you can see baking the diamonds into a cake in the opening cutscene of the base game, killed. More specifically, to prove how barbaric he is, he had the man's head cut off. So we then have to survive an ambush of four different snipers, and thank god they are incompetent as all hell because they fire three shots right at Louise's head, and he manages to dodge because that sniper is awful at his job. We have to take out the four snipers that surround the building, two of which get a special cutscene ending where they fall to the ground, and then a whole bunch more bad guys show up to try and kill us. This ended up being the first time that I died during normal gameplay, because it turns out that this jump here is too high to make and survive. But also, this whole area is just insane, with enemies lobbing grenades at you at all moments. In fact, I ended up dying several times here, and more importantly, the game crashed on me twice. I seem to recall this happening before, actually, and well, after spending more than 20 minutes on this one mission, and knowing that all it requires is killing all the enemies, and then running down a flight of stairs and driving away, I decided to just skip all of that crap and turn on god mode briefly so I could jump off the roof. If you think that's unfair, well, I blame the crashes, not my deaths. If it had only been my deaths, I would have continued to play it legitimately, but I wasn't about to spend some absurd amount of time just hoping that one time it wouldn't crash on me so I could complete the mission normally. I just don't have that kind of time to waste. If it weren't for the crashes, this probably would have been one of the better missions in the game. In fact, it is in general a pretty engaging and challenging one, but those grenades might make it a little bit too frustrating for my taste. Still, a good one, and a good indication that we are towards the end here because things have definitely ramped up. Although that can't necessarily be obviously seen from the next mission, the last Yusuf Amir mission, for the man who has everything. We've already stolen for him a military attack chopper and a noose tank, so what else could he possibly want? Well, apparently the crown jewel is actually a subway car. Kind of strange. Seems like we should have started with this. It's very civilian. So, in order to get our hands on one of those, we need to first go over to Broker and then jump on top of one. Then we have to climb to the front of the train and spend a while shooting out the helicopters that are chasing us. Luckily I still have lots of exploding rounds for the auto shotgun though. The whole mission ends up being mostly just another set piece of firing at the police a bunch. Though there is at least one opportunity where you can die fairly easily if your reflexes aren't good enough, when you have to duck underneath this one annihilator helicopter. And I guess it is technically very possible to get shot at by the cops while you're passing the few stations, but you move so quickly that you're very unlikely to die here unless you came into the mission without any armor. Eventually, you take out enough cops and get far enough along on the path for Yusuf to show up and grab the helicopter using a sky crane, something that Louise suggested he actually just buy because he also wanted one of these when we did the tank mission. But I guess he was totally willing to buy that and not the train car. Not sure why, though. Thankfully, though, you don't really have to do anything else once he arrives, as Louise unhooks the train car in a cutscene, and then Yusuf picks it up and drops you off in the middle of a baseball diamond. You also don't have to lose the cops, either, somehow. Once again, I'm not sure how exactly the police don't know exactly who did this, and exactly how to get to him, but once again, I have to assume it's just because of all of his money, which is a safe bet. 
And then, finally, it was time to do the last part of the diamond sequence for the Ballad of Gay Tony, Ladies Half Price. So, once again, because we already know what happens in the scene from the base game, there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room for what the actual mission part could entail. We drive with Tony over to the docks and get into a boat, and then we have to drive the boat over to Charge Island because the scene already happened the way that it did in the base game. This time, though, Tony acts relatively normal compared to his usual demeanor. Again, it also helps that all the lines have definitely been re-recorded once more. It's actually Louise who acts kind of funny this time, but it's less noticeable than the first scene where the diamonds are initially bought. Anyway, the literal only thing you have to actually do in this quote-unquote mission is shake the attacker off of the back of the boat. He can't climb onto the boat as far as I know, and the only metric for how well you did in the mission is how fast you drive the boat, which seems ridiculous. Oh, and how fast you knock the attacker off. But there's literally nothing else to do because Louise wasn't present on the island during the firefight, so they couldn't do that. Why they didn't have, I don't know, maybe some of Ray's men chase you in boats or something like that, I'm not sure, because otherwise this ends up being just another set piece cutscene mission. And honestly, kind of a waste of time. It's at least nice to see a resolution from this side of the perspective, but it's still a bit of a letdown. Only a couple more missions to go, though. And the next one is essentially the penultimate mission of the DLC, Party's Over. So Rocco calls Louise and tells him that it's basically either him or Tony. And while Louise is reluctant in the cutscene to agree, once the cutscene ends, we're just in the mission like Louise did agree, which is kind of weird. Either way, we have to drive over to the club and meet Rocco and Uncle Vince, and then have a cutscene where Louise almost shoots Tony before at the last minute deciding to kill Uncle Vince instead, but spare Rocco because apparently he is a made man. Not sure how Vince wasn't a made man, but sure, whatever. So Rocco runs away in order to still be in GTA 5, and then we have the most intense shootout of the game so far when wave after wave after wave after wave of Ray Bulgarin's men shows up to the club to try and kill us. Tony will stay on the main ledge and shoot down at them, where the game expects you to stay, and I think do something, but really the best way to handle this that I found was to go around to the only way they can get up to you and just spam the auto shotgun with explosive rounds as much as you possibly can. But like I said, it does get really intense because... I came down to my last sliver of health pretty quickly and then had to be very, very careful because there are still yet more you have to kill outside. And Tony just loves to be in your way while you do this. But killing him would definitely fail the mission, so be careful. Eventually, though, they do finally stop coming and Tony says that he's going to leave town and retire in a spa town in the desert. Not exactly Los Santos, but I guess that might be a bit of foreshadowing? though they definitely weren't thinking that far ahead, I don't think. Anyway, now we have only one real mission left to do, so let's get to it. So Louise heads over to Tony's one more time and finds him packing his things and getting ready to run away, just like he said. Tony, though, is initially a little hostile to Louise when he arrives, given the whole, you know, trying to kill him thing, but Louise assures Tony that he believes he made the right decision and that now... It's them against the world, or rather them against the Italian and Russian mobs. So the plan is for Louise to find and take down Ray before he gets a chance to strike back at them. But one thing that isn't really addressed by this mission is how exactly they get away from the Ancelotti's. See, in the last mission, it's implied that Don Ancelotti is convinced by Ray Bulgarin to do away with Tony or Louise and gives Rocco the choice of who to work with and Rocco obviously chose Louise. But then Louise kills Rocco's man, Uncle Vincenzo, and the two take down a whole mess of Bulgarin's men. Well, Louise does. So what happens to the Ancelotti's? Do they just forgive Tony for the chaos he's caused, or do they blame Rocco exclusively because of the whole diamond fiasco? I don't know. This mission sees us dealing with the Bulgarin problem, but the Italians are just kind of never mentioned again. Anyways... So somehow, because plot convenience, Tony just knows that Ray Bulgarin is currently packing up a massive load of H that he acquired 
after Nico Bellic took down the former owner, Dmitry Raskolov. He plans to use it to own the H-Trade in Liberty. But not only does Tony somehow mysteriously know about all of this, he also apparently knows exactly where Balgrin is doing this with zero explanation. Whatever, kinda weird. So, we have to drive down to Funland, the amusement park at Firefly Island in Broker, and on the way, Louise and Tony have a final heart-to-heart -heart about what they'll do if their plan fails. Louise asks Tony to go somewhere safe that nobody will think to look for him, so Tony says he'll be in Dukes, specifically by the monoglobe statue in the middle of Minnows Park. If Louise doesn't show up in a few hours, he tells Tony to assume he didn't make it and follow through on his plan to run like hell. We head over to Funland, and then it's time to finally destroy that H, and also, thankfully, kill Timur. So, this first part of the mission is a pretty decent encounter. Funland makes for a perfect battleground, and the aesthetic juxtaposition with the life-or-death stakes of what's going on feels perfectly in tune with the DLC as a whole. We fight through some guys, and while not technically one of the objectives, while we're fighting we can destroy all of the yellow duck bins that they have stored the H inside of for, uh, some strange reason, and then eventually we're given the opportunity to directly confront Timur, who predictably runs away. Also, Louise calls him Timmy the whole time, which I love. He tells us, though, before we kill him, that is, that Ray isn't here, and that he's already gone to Francis International Airport to flee the country, I guess. It isn't clear to me exactly when he made that decision, but given that two seconds ago they were talking about owning the H-Trade, it kind of seems implied that Ray was here just a moment ago and ran away as soon as Louise showed up. Either that or he just planned to leave the country anyways and run the business from afar, which would also make more sense. Either way, once all of Ray's men at Funland are dealt with, including Timmy, we jump on a conveniently placed motorbike and start racing towards the airport. There is an actual departure time, which happens to be the name of the mission, so we have to be kind of quick here, as I do recall actually failing the mission in the past because I took too much time fighting the baddies at the theme park and couldn't reach the plane on time. But on the way to the airport, Louise gets a call from Yusef and tells him now isn't the best time to talk, explaining that he needs to reach the airport and deal with the Russian mob, or both he and Tony are dead. Well, I have to assume Yusef was already just flying around in his buzzard because if he wasn't, then that man is like lightning, and the second he heard he could be of some help, he ran like the wind to a car, then drove to his helipad, and then flew all the way here in order to help take down some of Ray's men, who start pursuing us on the highway as we go to the airport. Here too, Yusuf proves that he is actually pretty good at at least one thing, flying a military-grade attack chopper, and using it properly too since he manages to take down every single car attacking us on the first shot, even somehow defying the laws of physics to do so sometimes. When we finally reach the airport, we then have to chase down Ray's plane, which is quite intense, and it feels very appropriately final mission. You can fail this part too though, so make sure to keep your pedal to the metal, or you'll completely botch the momentum of this otherwise quite good act of the last DLC. Reach the plane, and Louise does some serious action movie shit, shooting the guy at the exit and leaping onto the exposed staircase in order to enter the plane just as it takes off. All that's left then is taking down three more of Bulgarin's goons, before the man himself steps out of the cabin, threatening to pull the pin on his grenade and take everyone out if Louise decides to try and shoot him. Well, life or death circumstances never stopped Louise before, and they won't stop him now, so we simply shoot him, the grenade goes off, and somehow, some way, Louise survives the explosion and leaps out the back of the destroyed airplane and parachutes down into Broker while music plays without a vehicle, for one of the only times in the two DLCs or the base game, because, well, this is it. The end of the GTA 4 saga, so to speak. Unless you count Chinatown Wars, but, ah, uh, well, story for another day. We then just have to parachute to the ground and make our way to Meadows Park, where Tony is waiting, just like he said. Louise runs into that same homeless person that you see in one of the earlier Vlad missions in the base game, and we get to see what ultimately became of those diamonds. Somehow, 
Despite falling into what looked like a sediment dump truck, they actually ended up in the trash. But like, what? If that was supposed to be a trash truck, was it like a trash truck that delivered trash to parts of the city? Like, wouldn't they end up in a landfill? Instead, they somehow wind up in trash bags in Meadows Park, and that guy finds them. His name is Jerry, by the way. And it's then said later on the radio that he plans to open up a gun shop in Vice City with the funds that he has. So we better see this guy in GTA 6. Tony and Louise celebrate taking down all of their enemies. You know, except for the Ancelotti's, which remains just ambiguously unsettled. And Yusuf shows up to confirm his and his father's interest in franchising Mason at Nine clubs around the globe. Which we learn later on from GTA Online, Tony apparently does do. Well, he at least franchised to the West Coast, but who knows where else. And that's the end of The Ballad of Gay Tony. Now, I covered them out of order, so if I do cover The Lost and Damned, it isn't quite the end of the GTA 4 saga for the channel yet, but I make no promises. It would also be in line with the order I actually played them, since back in the day, I skipped The Lost and the Damned, and only played and finished it for the first time a few years ago. Anyway, what are my final thoughts on this grand ending to the GTA 4 era? So, what's my impression of The Ballad of Gay Tony 14 years after its initial release? Well, overall, I think that tonally it's a lot more consistent with the rest of the GTA series. But I can't necessarily say that's inherently a good thing. I mean, I do love the new radio stations, and the new weapons, and some of the new missions, especially drug wars, but overall it kind of just leaves me wishing that the base game had these things to begin with. Longtime fans of the channel, I think, already realize that my relationship to Grand Theft Auto has changed quite dramatically in the last few months. My political and personal perspectives on a lot of things have changed a lot as I myself have changed, and because of that, more often than not these days, playing GTA can leave me bitter and frustrated. But honestly, despite being the title that literally has gay in the name, I came away from Ballad feeling like it was more regressive in its message than even 4 was. At least in the base game of 4, a lot of the things I hate the most are the content of some of the advertisements, which remind me how bad things have been in the past for people like me, and leaves me worried about how things could be in the very near future. And really, how things still so often are. Roe v. Wade, anyone? But Ballad uses the F-slur so many times and so casually that it made me genuinely uncomfortable. The way that Louise and his friends act towards women is worse than almost anyone in the base game, though maybe not anyone in The Lost and Damned, and that scene that Louise has with Margot? In fact, Margot in general was a serious... Oh my god, people seriously once thought that this was not only okay, but funny? Moment for me. Not saying that these sentiments weren't clearly present in the writing staff when they wrote that, because it was probably a lot of the same team, and I'm not saying that I don't still have plenty of issues with 4 these days, either, but at least 4 doesn't focus on any of that. It tries to tell a story that, for the most part, doesn't have anything to say about queer people in America. Because, while I do think that Tony was a step in the right direction, and that his characterization is one of the better parts about the DLC, it still shines a spotlight on some truly awful things, and not in the intentional, look at how bad society is kind of way. I really think they thought that making fun of Margot or constantly using the F slur was just fine. Well, maybe not just fine, but it doesn't come off the way that, say, the use of the N-word in Mafia 3 does, as a means to remind you that these people are awful and you should not feel bad killing them. Hell, we don't even get to kill half the characters that look down on Tony for being different than they are. However, Tony does still emerge as the hero to a certain extent. I think he's certainly awful, just like a vast majority of GTA characters are, but as far as awful GTA characters go, he's not half bad. Perhaps among the series is most relatable and well portrayed. I've also heard similar sentiments from gay cis men in my audience, so I will at least give it that. A win is a win, and representation can and does matter. 
just waiting to see a decent portrayal of a trans person in GTA 6 now, and honestly, I think there's a damn good chance I'll get it, and you can bet I'll be keeping a sharp eye out for it. But what about the actual gameplay? I mean, it is a game after all, underneath all of the cultural commentary. Well, I'd say that more often than not, Ballad succeeds in marrying the best parts of GTA 4's mission structure with the structure of the older games in the series, bringing that bombastic and crazy GTA-ness to the world of HD Liberty City in a way that the base game and The Lost and Damned did not. But I think that it does still fall significantly short of, say, the tone in GTA 5. Granted, it had a different task of trying to take that gritty, realism-focused world in GTA 4 and making it fit more with the rest of the series, whereas 5 got to do that from the start, but still. It's unfortunate that the online services for GTA 4 have been officially shut down for a long time now, and even the unofficial, fan-created avenues for playing online are no longer easily accessible. Not since the purge before the GTA 6 trailer, anyways. Because the thing that I remember the most fondly about The Ballad of Gay Tony was its online mode. Still, I don't care enough to go and try to play a game today, if it even is still possible with fan mods, it just isn't the same. I'm a different person, the culture is different, and playing online games has a whole different context to it these days, so I can't really judge it based on that mode. I have to judge it solely based on what the single player experience is. And that experience is a fun, short little romp through Liberty City with a focus on the most iconic island of the game's four, that being Algonquin or Manhattan. I doubt I'll be returning to the Ballad of Gay Tony anytime soon. Probably not for a very, very long time and maybe not ever again, other than to film bits for episodes of A Criminal History, maybe. But the time I did spend with it this time around, I certainly did enjoy overall, even if its commentary ages a bit like almost any sitcom from the early 2000s, which is to say, not often very well. But hey, for what it was, for what it is, it's a grand old time if you enjoy the base GTA formula, and if you're a fan of the gameplay in the base game. It's definitely worth checking out one more time before we all collectively move on to the sunny shores of Vice City for the next decade and a half. I'm the Criminal Historian, and I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye bye! Thank mm -hmm. you.